Uh, I'm a teacher myself as well. So on the one hand, what I do is I do a lot of research projects into the future of learning, but also create uh, educational products, uh, particularly in a non-profit setting. So I worked a lot, for instance, with children in refugee camps to see if we can find new solutions for them uh, for learning. Uh, but I'm now also involved in a lot of sort of uh, space uh, science and technology programs uh, also in Europe. And in addition, I'm a teacher myself at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, where I teach about innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and um, this has been sort of my reality since March. I really remember when it was January, you probably all had the same. We heard what was happening in Wuhan and we were talking with students and everybody was like, yeah, but that's in China, that will never happen here. And two months later, basically I was stuck at home and teaching like this. And this is for now, at least sort of the new teaching and training reality. And I think it's changed for a lot of people and a lot of you also how you uh, basically can do your work. And one of the things that Mark just said in the previous discussion was that it's good to check in with people and uh, you all were really kind to actually contribute also to the survey that I created, the short little survey. And I just have a little like some feedback that you gave there. So one of the things I asked, how are people feeling? Well, you can definitely see people are a bit sort of center to going towards uh, feeling okay. And I really recognize this because in some days I'm sort of like, I'm usually about in the middle, a little bit more to the right, but some days also then suddenly I'm at the left and I find it really hard to connect to people and to students. And if you then ask the question to you guys, to trainers, like, okay, what did COVID mean for you? You see that it had a huge impact on your work. I mean, almost everybody agreed with the fact that it was a high or a very high impact on the work that you do. And if you look at some of the quotes that of course, you know, a lot of people said, and, and, and this is also true. I work also a lot with cultural institutions that face this as well. It's like a lot of work has been canceled or postponed. And also everybody had to show flexibility on suddenly transforming how you do your work. That is just something that is quite difficult because you don't get the time to do it. It's like from day one, we're just in a lockdown, make it happen. And there was nobody to train you usually, et cetera. So that is quite difficult. Uh, other people said it's also not just about the work being canceled or, or just missing the income. It is also mean, it, it also has an effect on, on the fact like, you know, if you're not fully working, there's also some nourishment basically that you miss, you know, with interacting with people, etc. And that's also something that, that people mentioned or that it could be very tiring because you constantly have to change your environment for work. And everybody, and I noticed that also at the universities, everybody who works with students or with young people feels super responsible for them. And you feel this big responsibility, you know that you have to do things online and that is all new, but also, and I really believe also in this quote, online is not a solution for everything and everybody. So we also know that in this moment, we are failing certain people. And I think that's also a feeling that that can be quite, uh, quite difficult, I think, uh, I notice myself. Um, I also ask what people learned in this period, a lot of people talked, of course, about their digital competences and how to maintain human relations in a crisis situation. Um, also, how can we turn obstacles and limits into opportunities and challenges? So I improved how to manage the unexpected and also how to manage a crisis situation. So, so something that is often mentioned, you only know how you will react when you're in a situation like this. And, and uh, I think this is a very interesting and, and good statement to make. Other people also said, how nice is it to be at home? In some cases, I totally agree because sometimes it's also nice, particularly I'm a big coffee and tea lover. So then I have my own selection of coffee and tea. Uh, that's something that's much better than what we get for instance at university. Um, and I thought this was also interesting because it refers a bit to the discussion that was also before the break is that to really uh, slow down, let it go, but also to listen what is here now. So what are my needs? What are people's needs? What are society's needs? And, and trying to listen and see how you can uh, uh, do it without going overboard, you know, without stretching yourself. Um, and this is, and I think this is crucial, I think for everybody, real life contact is crucial. Only online is not enough. Unfortunately, we're restricted to it, but this is something that came back very, uh, very evidently in a lot of the, the, the statements that were being made. Um, so even though this is our current new teaching and training reality, I'm pretty sure, and we have some good news on vaccines. I'm always a very optimistic person. So for me, I'm already planning summer holidays and stuff, but uh, I do think that, uh, that, that, that hopefully we will get a bit, uh, 
uh, ahead of this. And what you see, and this is also why I think this image is interesting, every time I talk about the future of learning and every time we were also talking about the future of learning in the project that we did already in 2011, the image that people have of the future of learning is very tech focused. So it's really like people behind computer screens, um, you know, here as well, you know, with the kids and a teacher behind a computer screen. And in 2011, we uh, did like with a consortium uh, uh, that was led by IPTS, which is one of the European uh, institutes for research. We did a study into the future of learning where we talked to hundreds and hundreds of experts throughout Europe to think about some of the things that they saw emerging sort of between 2020 and 2030. And uh, of course, technology plays an important role in it, but a lot of things were, went also way beyond uh, technology. And one of the things that I always think is important to do when you do these future studies, you don't try to predict the future. You try to focus on potential futures and see if you can identify perhaps some opportunities, but also some dangers that are lurking around the corner. And particularly with education, because it's the public sector, it's one of the, like with healthcare and education, it's also good to think about some dystopian futures, what might happen if governments don't intervene or don't step up, or civil society and others. So I don't know if people have seen Black Mirror, that Netflix show, uh, where, where they basically take some technological development that we see now and, and, and turn it into an extreme and then it becomes this sort of dystopian future. I think it's a very interesting instrument to think about the future and, and, and what our role could be in that future. So where are we now? I think that is a key question. So we did this study in 2011, it's now 2020, we're in the middle of a pandemic that forced everybody to go online. But did some of the things that we predict, did it hold true? So what I'd like to do is I would like to start with talking about three main predictions that we made. The, the, the report is much larger than that and it has a lot of other predictions, but I wanna focus on three and reflect on them as well. Then I want to have like a breakout session where you can talk in smaller groups about uh, one of the key issues that I see happening. And then after the break, and that's also uh, my key message, I think when we have to, when we think about the future of learning, we have to think about a human future, not a technology future, because technology is just a tool. It's about how can we humanize training and learning. And I have some suggestions for that, uh, which aren't just uh, on the level of a trainer or a teacher, but also on the level of the system. Uh, but, but I'll share with my ideas about that later on. So the predictions that we made in 2011, one of the core things that drove a lot of the things that we saw happening in the education market, and also all the experts agree with that, is that the evolution of ICT technology, so information and communication technologies, is impacting learning in a lot of different ways and it has a potential impact and like every technology, it could have a good impact or a bad impact. But we saw three main sort of developments going forward that, that ICT plays an important role in. And the first one is about personalizing learning. And I think in the discussion before the break, I think Marcus, when he was reporting back, I think you said something like, it's really important that we start to develop um, different learning paths for different people. And that's actually one of the things that in 2011 we were also discussing. So how can we create tailored learning paths for individual users? And technology, of course, can play an important role uh, in that because it's really difficult otherwise to keep track on what someone is doing, how someone is progressing, what someone might need. So that's, uh, that's, that for us was, uh, was a key development. And the idea was that if you personalize learning, we move away from a situation where we think of education as being about equality. So everybody gets access to the same lessons, the same trajectories, the same trainers, to a situation of what we call equity, where we start to think what is right for each individual learner. Uh, and that's a big difference because it might be that someone needs a lot more support or perhaps someone is really good at mathematics but has a problem with French. It might be that someone learns in interaction, other people do it in a different, different way. So one of the key promises, and I still believe that, of personalized technology is that we can move into sort of a situation where we can increase educational equity. So providing what's right for each. And I think that is a big, big difference from where we are today. So the idea is that 
individual needs should be more important than what we call institutional straitjackets. And if you think about classic education, as we still have it, for instance, also at university, it's typically a one size fits all with a few personal touches here and there. And also depending on the teacher, of course, some, some individual insights, but it's the same assignments. It's the same structure, the same lesson plan. Um, and of course, within the way we organize education, that's logical. But our conclusion was that personalization is becoming more important and that individual needs would therefore become more important than institutional straitjackets. And one of the key inspirations that we had for that was also if you look at what's happening in gaming. So gaming is basically the ultimate, I think, interactive personal experience where your behavior changes what happens. So one of the companies I find personally really interesting, and I'm still uh, trying to get to, to work with them on some project, is the French uh, video game company Ubisoft, which uh, creates a game called Assassin's Creed, which is a very, very popular game. And basically it's always set in sort of the past. And what they do is that this is, this is a video of, of uh, their latest uh, computer game, is that at a certain point they said like, if we create a video game, well, it's Assassin's Creed. So of course you have to kill people and, and uh, you, know, you have some certain objectives, but they created educational versions of it. So they used all the images that they had to create educational personal tours through sort of like, how did the Egyptians live? What was with the Romans? And in this case, it's about Greece and, and particularly Athens, but also the Spartans. So they would basically show you around what it would look like. And if you would then continue, basically, you could select a lot of different tours. So famous cities in ancient Greece, daily life, battles and wars, politics and philosophy, art, religion, and myths. And schools are now also working with this, but the interesting thing, of course, within the gaming experience that it is very personalized. So that makes it slightly different. So you can choose what are the topics that you like, but you can also interact with some of the figures within the game. So that was one of our biggest also inspirations to see like, how can we use some of these learnings to, to create more personal experiences for children and not restricted to technology, I have to say that. Um, the second thing that we saw also is that learning is becoming more collaborative. And with this, it's not collaborative that it's social working only, like you work in a group in, in order to learn something. But one of the key things that we also recommended was that we need to have more collaboration between education and training in society at large. Now, education is a separate silo that hardly interacts, of course, they interact with society and with trainers, et cetera, but there's gonna be a lot more collaboration. And this was one of the quotes also that some of you came up with, uh, that one of you came up with in, in the survey that said like, you know, one of the things I'd like for the future is to better have better recognition for youth work and for trainers work for personal and civic development of young people and youth workers. So a lot of the things that happen outside of formal education are also forms of learning that nobody really recognizes because in formal learning, we can only see what happens in the school or in the institution. Um, and our idea was like, if you can use technology to connect all these different actors around the child, like sports, like uh, youth work, uh, uh, music lessons, then you can also have a much broader overview of what's happening in sort of the development of children. And this is a good example of this. This is a project that, that, uh, that was done in, in Rotterdam. The year you see high school students making stop motion videos. And this was done in collaboration with artists that work together with children and the school. Uh, this is a school uh, that has a lot of children that have a lot of learning issues. So it's hard for them to learn. They, they don't have the cognitive abilities often. And one of the key things the school said, like these children have a really hard time to present them externally themselves, you know, to, to, to show themselves to the world. So at a certain point, they said, like, we as a school cannot solve this alone. So what we do is we work structurally with external artists and these external artists then help these children to express themselves in new ways and through that uh, basically achieve our learning goals. So they basically outsourced um, part of the learning to external artists because they said, you know, they can do it better. And I think it refers a bit to that old saying, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. You know, it's not just uh, one individual or a parent or, or a teacher. It's basically the whole community. Uh, so I thought that was quite, quite good. 
And the last thing that we focused on was that learning is becoming more informal. So basically what you see is that learning opportunities are everywhere, not just in formal education. Uh, and that we also need to take stock because particularly, of course, with the rise of, of platforms like YouTube and other platforms, we see that, that also children are learning everywhere. And uh, one of the things I think this is quite interesting, this is a TikTok video uh, from Louis Superfil. Uh, he's a French uh, American uh, man who is a French teacher and he has about uh, over 800,000 followers on TikTok. And basically he makes all these funny videos and some of them, this one I got from, uh, I, I downloaded it from YouTube, but uh, um, he is uh, super popular with, uh, with a lot of kids who, who have to learn French because he does it in a funny and in a new way. So I'll just, uh, I'll just share this with you. Tomber dans les pommes, to faint. Tomber dans les pommes, fall in the apples. All right guys, so today we'll be coming up with words to describe the act of losing consciousness. Yes, okay, um, so even we, Okay, and fall in the apples. I'm gonna regret asking this. <laughs> Could you explain that to me? Seriously, come on, this one is so obvious. I will explain. Okay. In France, we have lots and lots of apples. Everywhere apples. Apples on the trees, apples on the floor, okay, okay. So when you uh, pass out, you tend to fall in the uh, apples? Apples, yes, thank you, English. You fall in the apples. Okay, so if you tell a French person, I have fallen in the apples, tombé dans les pommes, they will understand. Oh, you have passed out. Yes? Falling in the apples. Tombé dans les pommes. <laughs> So it's really funny because every language has these strange sayings, right? So, and, and, and what he does is he does it in such a humorous way that a lot of kids like to watch these videos. They even share them on other platforms like Instagram and, 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 and on, um, on YouTube. And he's becoming more and more popular. So he has like a daily following of, of hundreds of thousands of people. So the, these were sort of the three big sort of uh, predictions that we made. So, so more collaboration, more personalization, and more informal ways of learning. And did our predictions come true? Uh, if you look at personalization, absolutely from a technological point of view. So what we see is that there's so much technology out there now that also is personalizing content supply, et cetera. Even also educational platforms are increasingly doing it. If you start to ask the other question, like are the promises met of personalization? I don't think so, because what we see, it's mainly used in a private context. Uh, the personalization technology is owned by big corporations that have a commercial interest, so not a public interest. So we see that actually education itself is not making use, I think, enough of personalization technologies and options. So it's really hard, I think, for them to help their children. And we're still in most of the schools in the traditional setting where institutions dictate what happens rather than individual needs. If we look at collaboration, we sort of see a similar thing. So we have network technology anywhere, everywhere. So wherever you go, you can connect to people and what you see is that a lot of people say, okay, this is fantastic because you know you can emancipate yourself, you can connect to uh, experts from all over the world. And what we see is that of course that happens, but it also reinforces existing networks. So if your parents know people, they can reach out to people on LinkedIn for their children for internships. Or if you have certain intellectual capabilities, it might be easier for you to find the right content. Or if you wanna get access to, to certain types of information, if you speak English or another like language that is widely spoken, it's much easier than if you speak only your local language. So what we see is that, again, like with personalization, collaboration is taking place, but it's not publicly organized. There's no public notion of like, what should we do with this from a public policy perspective? And the same goes for informatization. This was also part of our sort of uh, uh, dark mirror scenario where we basically said like, okay, uh, content and services are everywhere, 
on YouTube, wherever. But what we see is that increasingly there are new inequalities in access. So for instance, in my country, the Netherlands, there's a super popular uh, training program for children called Skula that really focuses on the school curriculum and children can play a lot of games. So if, you, if you're not good at mathematics or at language, you can play these games. And what we see is that, of course, the affluent part of society, people with money, they can purchase a monthly subscription for their children. And the children who already are in a rough spot, they're basically not having access to these services. And for me, if I look at the situation today, and I think it's quite dangerous, I think that education is the great equalizer, like everybody gets the same chances at the start of their lives. For me, that is increasingly under threat because there is hardly any public governance of what's happening in the private sector. So what we do is we basically run the risk of failing the most vulnerable children whose parents perhaps are, are, are low literate or don't speak the local language because they're immigrant children, et cetera. And what we do is that because we leave it totally to the private market is that we reinforce and strengthen the inequality that's already there. So the opportunities that we see through personalization, collaboration, informalization, they basically mainly benefit children who have a better start in life as it is. And of course, there are nuances there, but this is something I think that is quite, uh, quite, uh, quite crucial to, to, to look at because the public sector has these institutional straitjackers. They just look at what's happening in the school, and that's basically it. And they don't take charge of technology. You know, I've, I've had some discussions, for instance, with the, with, the, with the education ministry in the Netherlands saying, like, why don't we think about algorithms in the sense of what we want from algorithms from a public perspective? You know, to not put people in a filter bubble, perhaps to put them outside of a filter bubble, or to make sure that children uh, who don't necessarily uh, have parents that help them to look at educational material, that they get more educational material. And there's just no real discussion about this. And that means that there's sort of a lack of public guidance. So also to get back to one of the discussions before the break, I think um, uh, Darko Amitevsky, you said like you talked about the social dilemma. I think one of the key things, if we look at children and how they interact with digital media is that they just do whatever they want because nobody is helping them how to use it and particularly not within education. And uh, I think Jan, Jan Lai, I think you also said it's quite interesting, by the way, I love your background with uh, Shabaka. That's sort of one of my favorite uh, <laughs> characters uh, uh, of all time. Uh, but you said there's also a nuance because there's a lot of good that we can do with, with these technologies and it's being done on an individual basis, but not to the extent that we, we see it again as a means to, to become an equalizer for everybody. So I think that one of the things that we see at the moment is that we're reinforcing inequality. And the reason why I'm showing this image, this was quite interesting for me, was a really big insight is that there was a big uh, government round in the Netherlands on uh, education, cultural education and collaboration with cultural institutions for schools. And uh, they do that every four or five years. And they spent a lot of money, like, I don't know, a few hundred million a year to foster collaboration. And this year, the government said, like, we really want to have plans to address inequality and not having the same opportunities. And the government really thought of it like, oh, if you have a school with a lot of immigrant children, we need to help that school because those children often don't get access to culture. And when we started to make an inventory of the schools, we saw, like, actually, the schools are doing a lot of things in that direction. The biggest problems that the schools see is that the children that basically are in the school and of certain backgrounds with parents that don't have a lot of money, et cetera. They basically have the issue that they don't get access to anything outside of the school. They cannot go to music lessons. They don't go to museums. So what can we do to address that? So, so what we did basically is that we rewrote some of the conditions of the government <laughs> and uh, they also uh, agreed with it. So that was, that, that was, uh, that was quite happy. Um, but, but this reinforcing inequality is, I think, one of the key things that I think we, we have to address. And therefore, also for the breakout session, because I think the solution is not just in the school, it's the entire community and the entire public sector. One of the things I think that would be nice to discuss in a breakout session is like, what are the roles of trainers in reducing inequalities? And also, if we have enough time, because we have 15 minutes for this, what skills would trainers need in order to fulfill this ambition? So perhaps I'd, uh, Michelle Di Paola, 
could you perhaps unmute yourself? And, and because you said you're indicated that you can talk about your, uh, your group. So um, could you say a little bit about sort of, you know, what roles you see for trainers? Yep, we were discussing uh, a number of possible roles and also uh, attitudes, talking about the more general need for uh, building a, a, an inclusive culture in which we don't hold the space, but offer the space and uh, the same should be the, the behavior and the attitude of our target group. So let's more let's be more open to each other. But in terms of uh, uh, roles of trainers, uh, we were discussing uh, especially about the need uh, for uh, more attention on, on designing activities. Uh, designing activities meaning that if you want to tackle inclusion, you should really understand what is meant for inclusion in, in digital environments as well yeah. from one side and from the other side uh, understanding uh, what you can do uh, how diverse the, the possible approaches and methodologies could be uh, to, to ensure as much inclusion as possible so in a nutshell this would be all but yeah. it was very rich and ongoing discussion yeah, but thank, I think it's I think it's super interesting, and I also really like the comment that you made on on designing activities. One of the key things, for instance, that we uh, we learned in the projects where we tried to connect the cultural sector, so theaters and artists, and with schools, is that they don't speak the same language. So if you don't speak the same language, you will design activities that are not connected. And I think if you connect it, perhaps like if we talk about inclusion, if we talk about a mindset, as you said, you know, for for um, for understanding, you know, an inclusive culture, then you can really reinforce each other and really take different parts of that dilemma away from teachers, perhaps and something trainers can do more and other things is what teachers can do more. So I think that's a, that's a really valuable contribution. So, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I also had a question for, uh, let me see here, um, perhaps, so much coming in that's really it's it's really um, i always like i do it with students as well i see everything coming in live and then you have to decide sort of like what to focus on because we we're limited by time but uh, gabby can i perhaps ask you to comment a bit on your group so yeah we discussed uh, a few things one was the uh, the difference between being a youth worker and being a trainer many of us are both um so uh, whereas uh, as, as a youth worker you're uh, often very involved in the local community work or, or that was strengthened also in a, or, or, or was an opportunity. Then as a trainer, we, we question a lot, what is, what is our role when not directly working with young people? Um, we, we identify the role that, uh, that, that we can contribute, a week, but we cannot do it alone. And uh, uh, what we can do anyway is to address it, to address the topic, to put it on the agenda, and to, uh, to hold a space or create a space for discussion or for um, uh, creative um, elaborations of possibilities. So that, that was one of the things. Yeah. And anyway, I mean, it's anyway uh, always has been on the agenda. So in that sense, it's not so different because inequality uh, has always been an issue that we are very much in a part of our mission. Yeah. yeah, but now it's of course it's it's stronger, so we need to put more emphasis on it. Yeah. As and and, and when it comes to uh, to skills, yeah, we, we were questioning if it's only skills or if it's what kind of uh, conditions we create. So what kind of spaces do we create, uh, uh, and how much time do we dedicate um, to that? And you mean with conditions, like the conditions that you yourself create or that are, are imposed on you, sort of government conditions or other conditions or both? Or might be both, yeah. Yeah, yeah we didn't go so much into it, okay. but, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, what are the circumstances? How much time do we have? And what are the expectations maybe also from our uh, uh, employers, the yeah. NAs or the, the local governments or... Uh, yeah. Uh, whoever we do training for, um, but of course it's, I mean, the conditions is also linked to the needs of youth workers and sometimes things are not, not explained or not highlighted, but still you can see behind this in, in, in or inequality. Yeah. 
Okay, that's a very good point. And I also, what I really like what you said in the beginning, also the distinction between youth workers and trainers. And I think youth workers, they're so involved in the community that I think it also there, again, I see a lot of um, possible, or perhaps there are already connections, for instance, to formal education. So that's also perhaps a bit of a bridge to sort of the next part, because we, we don't have extreme amounts of time, but I will basically take all the input that everybody created and I will share it with the organizers. So it gets back to everybody as well. Uh, because I wanted to uh, quickly go to the second part of the, the presentation, because that is about humanizing what we call learning and training. And I always say it's people first, system second, <laughs> but it does mean you have to change the system in order to make that a reality. Um, and I always think it's really good to go back to sort of basic human rights, right? It's a European Convention on Human Rights, which governs basically the entirety of Europe, basically says no person shall be denied the right to education. And the question that we can ask, I think, in 2020 is like, what is education nowadays? Is it just restricted to what's happening in a classroom? Do people just have the right to education in a school? Or perhaps are we taking it a bit further and thinking of education as, you know, taking place in broader networks? Like you have school, you have the home situation, you have youth workers, you have sports, you have, you know, the cultural sector, you have all these different places where you as a young person can educate yourself. This is, by the way, a, a little image. It looks like, um, I don't know what you call it actually in English, like a dandelion, I think, right? Yeah, it's a dandelion, but it is actually an image of a, of a, of a digital network, how things are connected. Um, but I think perhaps we should move away from this notion that we only think of education and learning as something that is sort of, you know, uh, organized in schools and outside of it, you know, everybody can do their own thing. Um, and one thing I think that we could do is because a lot of people look at Amazon and Facebook and, and, and Instagram and think like, okay, there are a lot of issues there, a lot of ethical discussions, but there are also things that we can learn. And one of the things that, that, that really stuck with me, and this is a project I did with Google in Dubai, where, we've, where we basically worked with advertising agencies to think about like how to reach younger audiences, um, is that these companies, they create what we call user journeys. So one of the things that uh, they want, and particularly, of course, if it's Google or Facebook, they, wanna, uh, they want their advertisers to sell stuff. So what they did is they looked at like, what are the user needs over time? So basically they say, there's a person who might be walking around you know, somewhere and they see a billboard with an advertisement and they see something, the channel is the advertisement and they start to think, hmm, it might be nice to buy a new television because I see a billboard with a Samsung television. Once you start to think about that, I might want a new television. You might go online, you go to watch reviews, look at different TVs, you go to the website of Samsung, LG, Philips, everybody who's sending it. And you have different channels that you can use in order to respond to that user need. At a certain point, if someone thinks about it long enough and decides I wanna buy it, that's what we call conversion in commercial terms. Um, you also have different channels for that. So how to make it easy for people to buy something as quickly as possible. That is a, that's an art form. So there are people whose only job is to make sure that people buy as much and as quickly as possible. Also on their own channels. And after that, you might have the care phase. So let's say you bought a Samsung TV, then you might want to watch some YouTube tutorials on how the Samsung TV works. And Samsung is providing these, 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 uh, these uh, um, uh, tutorials as well. So in this last phase, they basically try to care about the users and they basically try to think about what the users need and what channels do I use for that. And I think what they do, if you look also at some of the user journeys that they design is that this whole user journey is filled like with an incredible amount of channels. It could be newspapers, e-commerce websites, it could be um, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, uh, Facebook, Google ads, uh, uh, depending on the country in fee contact if you're in, in Russia. So they take all these different channels and turn it into a single journey to make sure that the user gets what they need when they need it. And I think that logic that is also working, that people have thought of, uh, is something that we could also use, I think, for learning. And to me, that would mean that we would take the instructor as the central entity, not a commercial algorithm, 
or a commercial company, but the instructor that basically helps set together with the student what are the learning needs? What is, what is it that this person needs? Not saying like, this is what we offer. No, sitting down and trying to find out what, what they mean. And for me, an instructor is not just a teacher. It could also be a youth worker. It could also be a social worker. It could also be, I don't know, anyone who's qualified to do that. But they are the ones, I think, to, to help set the learning needs with the students. So thinking about Google again, you know, the objective there is very simple. How do I get someone to buy? Here, the question should be, how do I get someone to learn? Um, and you have to focus on that individual learner. So what do they need? So let's make that equity center stage, not equality, set out a personal learning trajectory on all these different channels. And the instructors, I really believe it because teachers and instructors that work directly with kids, they are the most important instruments that we have for learning. That won't change, no computer program will change that. That is basically just a human interaction. We have so much research on it. You can, Paul Kirchner, Professor Paul Kirchner, he, he wrote an incredible amount on this. If you, He was also involved in this study. Um, it might be interesting to look at some of his work. But what we can also do is start to see what is the context of the learner? Where does he live? You know, what, what are certain things in his environment or her environment that we might also use in order to get them to learn more about what they would like to do? And how can we monitor what they do? That's also what Google does. How can we learn from what we monitor and how can we adjust the learning path according to what's happening with this individual learner? Uh, and then, and this is what a lot of people also forget, is that we have to empower this context. So once you start to orchestrate learning over different channels, you have to start to speak the same language. So if there are certain learning needs that I have identified for this particular pupil, and that pupil goes to do something in the theater, then of course, it's, it will be really interesting for the people who are coaching that students or teaching the children in the theater to understand what are the learning needs of this pupil. So can we sort of share some of that information with relevant players um, if we wanna orchestrate it, but also can we remove some of the obstacles because money for learning now goes to schools. Why can't we take a part of it or extra money, that would be my preference, and bring that to cultural institutions, to youth workers, if they take charge of part of the learning. Um, but also, you know, how can we help, for instance, this is a huge project in, in, in Holland for the last eight years and is four more years going, is to help all these cultural institutions to speak the language of education. What does it mean if you want to teach someone something? How can you monitor that? And how can you deal with that? Because that was a big obstacle for, for cultural sector to, to actually collaborate with schools on learning trajectories. So we have to think about how we can empower the context around children. And it could be anything that's sort of, you know, close to them or that they can use. And then we get perhaps... And this is sort of not like a finalized version. It's just something I'm, I'm thinking of and working on is to sort of think this whole notion of, of learning journeys where we start to think of, you know, you have to learn certain things. And can we think about like that learning is not just in the school, but we can think about what can we do in the home? What can we do external? What can we do online? So for instance, in the home, one of the things, and I've discussed this also a few times with, with for instance, the people at the, the, I live in Amsterdam, so with the, with the municipal council here, every, I think 99% of the parents want their children to do well. We have a lot of children and it's a lot of other European countries as well from immigrant backgrounds, you know, particularly from, from, from uh, at the moment from, from Syria and Iraq that want to integrate in society. Parents don't speak the language so well, but parents, usually have smartphones and parents perhaps can just, you know, put on a little podcast on the phone without even understanding what's being said. Why don't we help parents in the home through public institutions to help their children by basically having someone read a story to them in Dutch every evening, just by pressing a Spotify playlist, for instance. You know, it's just something that you could easily give to parents. And it's just a really tiny example that, of course, needs much more elaboration. But people aren't thinking about what we can do in the home to help parents help their children. Uh, or, you know, how is your sports or your music lessons, how are they connected to school? What are children doing online? How is that connected to schools? 
And I think the key issue in order to achieve this, to think in multiple channels rather than just a school, is to make sure that public funding goes to all these different elements as well. So also to youth workers, also to cultural institutions. So to not think of like the learner journey, learner journey is something that the school organizes and the school pays for. No, part of it should also go, I think, to other channels, just like Google and Amazon and all do it. So that's sort of my, uh, my two cents. So if we think about it, it takes a village to raise a child, I think it takes a network an empowered network orchestrated by instructors to educate a child. I think for me, that is sort of, if we want to make sure that, 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 that we reduce inequality, I think this is sort of the direction we have to head into. And this needs much more further details and, and, and further inquiry. And I know there's a lot of initiatives in this field as well. But for me, this is something that is, uh, that is uh, quite important.